Good evening, all. I'll start with our speakers tonight. Um, Glenn Rice was one of the, he was the lead editor of this special issue of Phoenix Underground. And Glenn has a deep history of working here in the, in the greater Phoenix area, has worked up in the Tano Basin. So he brings a great deal of relevance to tonight's discussion of uh, Salado in the Phoenix area. And Jeff Clark, a deep history as well. Um, both of these guys worked in the Tondo Basin uh, contemporaneously back in the, I think it was the 90s. It's, it's a, a, a distant era. <laughs> and um, so, and they've continued to uh, carry out research and gain, I think really gain dramatic new insights into the story of the uh, developments in the, from the 1200s up to the 1400s here in the southern southwest. So we're going to set this up with a uh, lead off about 20 minutes uh, from Jeff Clark and then about 20 minutes from uh, Glenn. Um, you notice they're, they're sitting on opposite sides of the podium here, so uh, we're hoping that that's enough of a barrier to keep the, um, you know, fisting, fisticuffs from coming out into the audience, but uh, they're pretty good gentlemen, so I think we're probably safe. Um, and then there's an opportunity for about 20 minutes of, of question and answer from, uh, with the audience. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll get the slideshow going, and uh, Jeff will start. Thanks very much. I'm going to kind of... Uh I want to put the Salado in kind of a, a larger perspective, and then I'll end up kind of discussing Phoenix. But um, I, I, it's part of a much larger uh, phenomenon. And this is just a slide of, um, of uh, archaeological cultures in the Southwest that you guys have probably all seen. We know that archaeological cultures are not real human cultures. But if we look at these areas, they're multilinguistic, they're multicultural, but they they kind of act, they're kind of like worlds in some ways. So there's an ancestral Pueblo world, there's a Hohokam world, there's ways of doing things in each world. So looking at them as kind of worlds might be a kind of a better way of, lo of looking at that. And you can see that the Salado um, spans uh, uh, two of those worlds pretty substantially, uh, Mugion uh, into Hohokam. Um, and we're only going to be focusing on the, on the Western Salado uh, today. But it's good to note that how, how large that Salado area is. And um, uh, we think of it as kind of a religious overlay. Um, there's a lot of material culture, artifact, ar ar architecture, burial, uh, heterogeneity in this area. Uh, the only common denom denominator in this area is Salado polychromes. So this Salado, we see this kind of uh, religious overlay. We think it, it's very much tied to the polychromes. And we think that um, 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 you know people are pre practicing their own cultural and linguistic traditions, but participating in kind of a, a religious, a larger religious entity. Um, and uh, I just want to note that some Hohokam groups, especially um, as you get out in the Papagaria, never uh, participated in Salado. So, um, as I said, uh, Salado is largely defined by um, um, the polychrome horizon. Uh, and um, I actually have to talk to my slides because that's where my notes are. Sorry, Linda. It's off the top a bit, but uh, there's, in terms of the Salado chromes that define that, uh, um, that overlay, there's kind of uh, some widely accepted facts about those polychromes. First, uh, um, they're largely ancestral Puebloan technology and style, uh, specifically uh, um, uh, the Cayenta area up in northeastern Arizona, uh, the carbon paint and the bold designs is, are, are very Cayenta-like. Um, they're made largely with the coil and scrape method instead of the paddle and anvil method, so technologically they're, they're more Puebloan. Uh, they're first produced along the uh, uh, Mugion Pueblo boundary, um, and they're... Oops. Uh, they're traded uh, into the uh, Tano Basin here, but this is where they're first produced with Pinto polychrome. And then you can see the later types, uh, uh, um, Gila polychrome, Cliff polychrome, and Tanto polychrome. Um, 
These are mass produced in the, south, in the southern southwest after 1325. Um, so this is, defines that, that, that uh, Salado uh, horizon. And uh, it's important to note there's not one production area and then a lot of trade. Uh, there are many production areas. Um, generally, each valley has maybe one to three production areas. And despite that very multicentric production, um, there's pretty high stylistic homogeneity amongst the Salado polychromes. So you have to explain that homogeneity even though there's many producers. So these, I think, are, are kind of widely accepted facts about Salado. Um, next. Um, in terms of the Cayenta connection, um, um, we have got some really good evidence that I think is widely accepted as well, that there are Cayenta immigrants moving down into the uh, southern southwest, including the Hohokam region, um, in the late 1200s and early 1300s. And these are just some of the markers we have that, are, 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 that we use to track them. And a lot of these are found at uh, um, the enclave sites that we have. We've got uh, this entry box. We've got a very Puebloan firebox and then these deflectors that are really uh, much larger. Uh, that are called entry boxes that are specific to the Cayenta region showing up at these enclaves. Uh, we've got kivas with a lot of the kiva features uh, showing up um, in several of the enclaves. Um, this is keat seal polychrome made up in the, Cayenta, in the Cayenta region. And this is Maverick Mountain polychrome made in southeast Arizona. So you can see a pretty good ceramic connection here. Um, and this isn't being traded into southern Arizona. This is being locally made in southeastern Arizona. And then perhaps what I think is the most important uh, uh, piece of material culture are what we call perforated plates. And this is a, a Patrick Lyons, a, a director of Arizona State M Museum's passion. Um, these are in the Cayenta region uh, prior to migration in the late 1200s, but they start showing up at these enclave sites in the, uh, uh, w when they come down here. And um, based on uh, pigment on the plates, um, fingerprints, and raw clay adhering to some of the plates, um, it's pretty obvious they're being used uh, for uh, production of pottery. And um, um, what the perforations are for, um, it's debatable. But they seem to be used by Cayenta potters uh, to make, uh, um, given the fact that they have red slip uh, on them that matches Salado polychromes, they could be very well making Salado polychromes with them. And we think that. These other things kind of go away through time, but the perforated plates stay throughout the entire Salado period. So I think these perforated plates are a good tracker of Cayenta groups. Local groups don't seem to be using this pottery tool uh, uh, that much, as far as we can tell. Um, next. OK, the Cayenta up in northeast Arizona. You've got the migration routes. Uh, those blue areas are the, what we think are the primary landing zones. Um, and um, um, uh, with the question mark in the Tano Basin. Uh, this area here, they're probably going through Point of Pines, uh, which was a kind of a gateway settlement between the northern and southern southwest. And um, if you remember the culture area map, they're kind of between Membris and Hohokam. The platform mound distribution here is uh, uh, showing the Hohokam region. Um, and this is where it gets a little more controversial because uh, we argue uh, at Arc Southwest that there's kind of a Cayenta diaspora. They lose their homeland. There's about 8,000 Cayenta up there at some point. They percolate down uh, this migration path. Uh, they, d they disperse, uh, but we think they have a persistent identity and they're maintaining contacts between their various enclaves. And that may be part of the reason that Salado polychrome is so homogeneous, because uh, they're maintaining contact. And in the Hohokam region, they're definitely settling on the northeast margins of the Hohokam world. So they're not in Phoenix yet. Um, um, but th these are sort of the initial landing zones. And um, I'm going to just quickly focus on the San Pedro we've been working extensively over the past uh, 20 years or so, 30 years maybe. Um, so you'll be seeing a blow up of this area here. These, these, these uh, triangles are platform mounds. And uh, you can see the Cayenta zone entering to the south uh, next. This is just a blow up. Uh, the, the San Pedro is, is 
one of the last uh, relatively well-preserved river valleys in the southwest, and almost all the archaeological sites are preserved in some form or another, so we have a good look at settlement pattern. And what we have here is we have a Kayenta migrant zone where a lot of those uh, markers are showing up to the south, um, and then people are dispersed before the Kayenta come in, but once the Kayenta come in, they kind of circle up the wagons and build these compounds. There'd be a lot of rooms in there, uh, but these, uh, they also start building a uh, platform mounds, pretty small little platform mounds compared to the Phoenix Basin. But uh, um, uh, we think that these, these platform mounds, in addition to serving an internal function, are also kind of marking the turf of groups. They're very visible on the landscape, the, 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 the local groups when the Kayenta migrants arrive. I should say, this is really where the home team is. This, this is Arabiper Creek. This is the best land in the San Pedro. And these platform mounds have, and have uh, uh, there's ball court villages around here. This is where the, the whole com really set up shop uh, and for, uh, for about a millennium before these settlements. So a very long trajectory. So this is the local team. This is the Cayenta uh, uh, area here. And then we've got these other platform mounds that are kind of um, ha have relations with both. Uh, next. This is just a diagram that we've, we've stylized the, the platform mound sites as triangles and the Kayenta enclaves are um, either triangles or blue squares here. And um, we break up this, this San Pedro into kind of two time periods. There's an initial time period, maybe a generation or two in the late 1200s, early 1300s, where we see tensions. Um, we see these very defensive settlements near the boundary, uh, High Mesa and uh, Reeve Ruin. And you can see that at Reeve, this is a reconstruction of the, one of the enclaves. They've actually built a defensive wall across the, the ridge there, so they're augmenting the, uh, the natural terrain. In addition to the, the defensible locations at the border, um, the, local, the locals are uh, making this red on brown pottery, kind of reviving this tr tradition here. Uh, the immigrants are making their Maverick Mountain. Um, and um, while some of the platform mounds are getting both, uh, these platform mounds up here really don't like Maverick Mountain, and uh, uh, the, the immigrants hate San Carlos Red on Brown. You don't find hardly assured there. So we think that these tensions are being kind of expressed on ceramics. There's some sort of a ethnic tension going on here. Uh, next. Then we have a much longer period um, when we start seeing the production of Salada polychromes in the San Pedro. What's interesting is that Salada polychrome replaces both of these very socially divisive traditions. Um, we can tell uh, based on uh, uh, matching sands in the pottery with sands to the washes that was largely made in these, uh, in these enclaves. And I, I, I should mention that th these enclaves are a minority population. They're a minority even in the landing zones that I, that I showed in the previous slide. So we're talking about maybe 15 to 20 percent of the population here max is, is, uh, is Kayenta. So it's interesting that um, they they make a, make a new ceramic type um, and it replaces both their type and the local type. And it's kind of interesting as an immigrant minority that this is happening and that's what we're trying to explain um, um, in, on a larger scale. And I should say that a lot of polychromes look like very closely to another uh, 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 type of ceramic made in the Kayenta homeland called Tucson whiteware. Basically, same kind of carbon paint. Um, you can see the symmetry is very similar, the only, with the addition of the red slip on the, on the Salado polychromes. Uh, I also want to point out that um, Salado polychromes are just ubiquitous. I mean, they're everywhere on these sites. They're covered. The, the, if you excavate these sites, uh, you get Salado polychromes everywhere. And it's hard to believe that um, there wasn't a household that didn't have a Salado polychrome vessel. Uh, next. So trying to explain this phenomenon, um, um, first looking at Salado polychrome symbols, um, about 40% of the symbols uh, of the vessels have some sort of uh, what has been interpreted as horned or feathered uh, serpent imagery. And um, uh, of course, there's a possible indirect connection with uh, Quetzalcoatl, uh, the uh, feathered or horned serpent uh, from Mesoamerica. And um, even though this is one of the 
last surviving codices from the Aztecs, I think. Uh, he's eating, the, the serpent is eating this person uh, there, not very uh, friendly. Uh, it's been argued in Mesoamerica that this was a very, uh, th this actually, um, uh, Quetzalcoatl cult actually integrated uh, groups from various backgrounds in, in Mesoamerica. So maybe um, the, the repurposing of, of that and, and Ancelotto polychrome may have been uh, something that helped integrate local and immigrant groups. Also, um, um, at least amongst the Pueblos, they have a number of fertility and rain deities um, that are, are either horned or, or, or feathered serpents. Uh, Zuni Kolawisi, uh, Tewa, uh, Awanyu, and I, I can't pronounce the Hopi one. <laughs> but um, I did, uh, interesting, Aadam groups do not have this, this as far as I know, uh, uh, this kind of a, a serpent uh, uh, deity. And I got this off the MNA website, Museum of North, Northern Arizona. Uh, this is a, a modern mural made there by, by an artist, but it's interesting that it's interpreted uh, um, the Hopi water serpent returns to teach the brother sister twins the responsible truths necessary to unify all humankind, including all religions. So, a very integrative, inclusive role there, if that's the case. Uh, next. Another thing that I think is important to point out on Salado polychromes, and you can start thinking, well, that's a horned serpent, maybe, and you can see serpents. You can start making up serpents, maybe, too. Um, but this is, uh, this is kind of seriating salado polychromes through time here. And um, two points. Uh, first, decoration is largely on the interior, so it seems very private. Um, and as you go through time, you see, um, if that's the serving line, there's a design field above it. And then exterior designs uh, on, uh, on, on later vessels. That scale is the same in each. And you can see a large increase in the size of these bowls. Uh, this might have been an individual serving bowl. These would have probably been used in communal feasts. So um, if you've got um, um, everybody using salado polychromes, uh, the immigrants and their descendants and the locals, uh, it's not hard to imagine that there were, you know, kind of multicultural feasts going on where uh, these vessels and their powerful symbols were being prominently displayed during those feasts. So a fairly inclusive participatory religion. Um, next. This is, gets closer to um, what Glenn will be talking about. But this is the Kayenta landing zone here um, in the middle of the map. And you can see that uh, the spread of Salado from that landing zone hit, goes into the Phoenix area and then goes um, into uh, New Mexico and Southeast Arizona. And um, uh, this is basically through the work of Lewis Bork, uh, who did his dissertation uh, on this. Uh, but basically, his argument is that um, um, you have the, in Casas Grandes, you certainly have a fairly hierarchical uh, uh, center there, um, and um, I think I, I, I can make the argument for the Phoenix Basin as well, and that this very inclusive religion is pushing back and making traction against these more hierarchically organized religions because uh, Salado is a much more participatory, inclusive uh, uh, message. Um, in terms of the platform mounds, um, this is a Medler mound, which is actually a very small mound in the Tano Basin compared to the large mounds in the, uh, in the Phoenix area, um, two rooms on top. Uh, these mounds are pretty well uh, engineered and built with huge walls and, and retaining walls. Uh, we estimated that it took 2,527 person days to build Medler mound. Basically, people that were up on the mound, um, either living there or performing rituals, um, had a higher status, perhaps an elite status, over people that were um, uh, watching down below. So that's basically the basic argument for, uh, for hierarchy that we might be able to go into later. But I, I do want to note that these arrows are showing the spread of Salado beyond those initial landing zones into areas where there are fairly hierarchical systems. And I think part of the appeal of Salado is that inclusive uh, even though it's emanating from this immigrant population, this inclusive message that's much more of a horizontal 
um, um, uh, message. I, to popular audiences, I use the, the, the analogy of Christianity and early Christianity in Rome, where Christianity develops on the edge of the Roman Empire, a very small group, and eventually starts spreading into towards the towards the center. The question is is whether um, migrants, by this time migrant descendants, or um, um, locals are responsible for this spread. Because uh, if it does gain traction among local groups, they could be spreading it as well. Um, one answer to that question may be to looking at how salado polychromes are produced. Um, if it's paddle and anvil, that would be a more hoacom tradition. Um, and if it's uh, coil and scrape, that would be more of a Pueblo tradition. So uh, if, if hoacom potters are, are making a lot of salado polychromes, eventually I'd expect to have more paddle and anvil pottery. So that's something to think about. Um, next. Uh, I, I'm just turning to the Phoenix Basin here, or the lower salt in particular. You've probably all seen this slide of uh, the major canal systems and major sites in the, uh, the Phoenix area. By this late time period where we start seeing a fair bit of salado polychromes in the lower salt, the Phoenix Basin is in decline, and I think Glenn and I both agree on, on that. Um, I think we might disagree on how fast that decline actually occurred, especially population loss. Um, we see it as more of a process that ha happened over a series of generations so that um, we have the Phoenix Basin population declining while they're still trying to maintain these large canal systems. And they may be uh, drawing on and accepting people from around uh, the Phoenix area, including by now Cayenta des descendants, um, into the uh, area, especially at these tail end settlements where there's a lot of fields and a lot of labor needed. Um, um, uh, accepting immigrants into these communities. Um, and that's indeed where we see the highest concentration of perforated plates, which I would argue is an indicator of uh, Kayenta, at this point, descendant uh, potter uh, um, and households, uh, perhaps as well. And uh, we have Las Colinas and uh, Los Muertos. There's probably a lot more Los Muertos. Los Muertos was dug in the 1800s and they threw away a lot of plain wear shirts and plain perforated plates weren't that jazzy. Um, so um, um, certainly I think we have Cayenta descendants in both areas. And um, I th we, we have pretty good evidence now of local Salado polygrome production. Um, at Las Colinas, uh, um, um, some sourcing studies were done by Patty Crown that match clays in settling bases with some Salado polychromes. And we have a recent study at Los Muertos that suggests local production there. Of course, there's local groups at these sites as well, so we don't know really who's producing the, uh, the, uh, the Salado polychromes. But I think getting, you know, looking at whether they're paddle and anvil versus coil and scrape would be an interesting exercise in, in terms of who's actually making them. And at this point, immigrant descendants are like two or three generations in, and they probably, you know, the distinction between local and immigrants, except for the immigrants who are continuing to use perforated plates, is, uh, is pretty, uh, uh, might have been relatively minor. And finally, I, th I know Glenn will touch on this as well. I think that the, the Salado platform mound tension um, was relatively equal, and I think both religions got transformed when they reached when, when they entered the uh, the cent when Salado entered the center. Um, essentially, um, again using Christianity in Rome as an example, when Christianity penetrated Rome, um, Christianity was uh, uh, altered fairly dramatically and became much more uh, hierarchicalized. If that's a word, um, but um, uh, something, some sort of hybridization, religious hybridization, I think, is going on here as well, where, where Salado is actually becoming, uh, is getting changed as platform mounds are getting changed as well. But I think through time, Salado is gaining traction um, um, in this area because you see Salado polychromes uh, increasing, I think, in general in density over time. Last slide, okay. There's just Oh, uh, Adam history and traditions. There's in the, in the uh, traditions. There's this epic struggle between the Wushgam and Huhugam, and um, 
the Wushgam emerge from the south and ultimately defeat the Huhugam. The Wushgam are kind of considered more simpler. The Huhugam are more greedy and uh, overreaching. Uh, you've got that dialectic going on. Uh, so these groups that are saying no to Salado out here, there's, there's decorated ceramic traditions out here and down below and to the south. Um, um, just wondering whether they're the Wushgam and, um, and the Huugam are kind of a combination of, of the Salado and platform mound, uh, that hybridization, uh, just as a, a thought. And finally, I just want to point out the, uh, I think I'm pronouncing it right, the Wigita ceremony. Um, which is largely practiced by Adam, Tona Adam groups, records that we've been able to ascertain. It was last practiced in 1945 in Santa Rosa, but um, um, it was acquired by a northern group, and it was very important that they um, do everything exactly right, and that's part of the reason they don't practice it anymore, because they don't understand the concepts from the ceremony, so it has to be carefully copied Otherwise, something could go wrong because there's not a complete understanding of the various elements of that ceremony. And that ceremony includes uh, feathered mask costumes, clowns, singers, processional dancers. Uh, sounds very Puebloan, very Hopi. Um, and uh, wondering whether they got this ceremony during the uh, uh, Salado period. So I'll end with that. Jeff didn't go quite as far as I thought he was going to go, so I'm going to sound a little aggressive uh, in my presentation, <laughs> but there are elements of what I'm going to address that are in the Phoenix uh, uh, Underground magazine. And um, f for me, I think that the point that we're debating um, is, was the spread of Salado migrants or of their ideology a factor in the abandonment of the Hohokam platform mounds. And uh, Jeff's group says yes, and I will uh, talk against that as the, the uh, opposing side. And I do agree with Jeff on uh, four points. And the first point is summarized in this map. Uh, it certainly, uh, people did begin to leave the Colorado Plateau in the late 1200s and move southward. And um, I also agree with him that the Salado polychromes, the symbols on the Salado polychromes probably have religious significance. Uh, they're religious icons. I also accept Jeff's characterization that Salado ideology was inclusive because the households were actively participating in the religion. They made the Salado polychromes, they used the Salado polychromes. Um, so they're engaged in the production of religious items, and the large bowls were used for serving food at feasts. And I, uh, the next map, I also agree with Jeff that Salado ideology spread across the Hohokam platform mounds, and also eastward into the Mogollon and Membres Pueblos, um, because that's where we find Salado polychromes across this broad area. And the two points that I will disagree with him on um, is, uh, for, has to do first with how did the ideology split, spread into the platform mound areas. Jeff says it was carried by migrants. More recently, Jeff and his crew say that some of it was carried by migrants and some of it was spread um, through borrowing. I will go, take the stand that I don't see any evidence for a lot of migrants in the Phoenix Basin and that the ideolo ideology spread through borrowing. Um, and second, what effect did Salado ideology have on the Hohokam? Jeff says that the Salado ideology was a, had a populist message and that the ideology contested the elite's control of, of the Hohokam platform mounds. And this eventually, this contest, led to the abandonment of the platform mounds. I will show that the Hohokam villagers uh, were very engaged in their religion and they had ready access to the ritual space on the platform mounds, and Hohokam religion was inclusive, it was ecumenical, as was the Salado ideology. Uh, the two did not conflict, and Salado ideology spread across the platform mound populations precisely because it was compatible with their existing beliefs. So Jeff says yes to migrants, and conflict between the religions 
and even war of religions. Um, Glenn says migrants know and ecumenical unity between the religions. Um, so let's take a look at these two questions. Were there slaughter migrants in Phoenix? Um, and I'll begin by addressing the question first for the San Pedro area. So if we can backtrack one slide, please. Um, you see the San Pedro, Jeff can point out to you there, yes, and he showed you slides. Uh, and there's very good evidence for Salado, uh migrants in the San Pedro Valley. Uh, we can see their villages with their unique architectural style, ceramic traditions, and ritual spaces. And those differ from the villages of the Hohokam. And these kinds of Salado enclaves are missing in the lower salt, that is where we are right now, and on the middle Gila. And Jeff and his team suggest that Salado migrants settled in some parts of the metropolitan uh, Phoenix metropolitan area, and not others. And because they've been living for several generations among the local Hohokam populations, their households are no longer ar archaeologically distinct. And so, uh, but they, he insists nonetheless that there were my, uh, Salado migrants in the Phoenix area, and that you can track these neighborhoods by uh, looking at the Salado ceramics. This leads Jeff close to a tautology. Salado ceramics, sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Salado ceramics equals Salado people. We certainly have Salado ceramics, therefore there must be Salado people. However, he has a clever analytical plan for wiggling his way around out of this box, and I like that plan. I would like to see the results. Uh, it's still in, we're not even, you're not even certain the methodology would work. So first they've got to test the methodology, and then they've got to collect the data. And th this is a very interesting thing. I applaud you for developing this hypothesis and uh, look forward to seeing the results. And so we have something to talk about in the future. And I'll leave the question of were there Salado uh, migrants in the Phoenix area uh, uh, at, at that. And then what was the effect of Salado ideology on Hohokam populations? Jeff, and this comes out particularly well in the uh, Phoenix underground, Jeff and his colleagues uh, draws a contrast between Hohokam religion in the Balcourt era and the Platform Mound era. In the Balcourt era, religion was open and, and participatory, and there was an even distribution of power. And in the Platform Mound era, uh, religion was hierarchical, religious control was restricted to Platform Mound elites, and there was inequality in political and religious spheres. I frankly think there's inequality at all times. Um, so I don't see much of a difference between the platform mound and the ball court eras. But at all times, people also think that they're equal. So there's an egalitarian ethos in both time periods. But so at 1350, along comes Salado ideology. And Jeff says that was inclusive. It appealed to the disenfranchised Hohokam households and uh, following the Salado fluorescence, Jeff's term, power returned to more equitable distribution throughout the Hohokam region. Now, Jeff is in good company. Um, many other researchers also contrast, draw this contrast between the open participatory religion of the ball courts and the exclusionary religion of the platform mounds. I think that is a false contrast. It does not incorporate what we've learned in the past three decades about ritual space at platform mounds and the rituals that were conducted there. So in the rest of these 20 minutes, I'm gonna try and correct that by looking at ritual space at, at Hokan platform mounds and one particular ritual, the cactus wine's uh, supplication for rain. So the next slide, actually down, there we go. So all Hokan platform mounds combine two architectural elements, a platform, a monument, and several council chambers located on or around the platform. This is compound B at uh, the Pueblo Grande Ruin. And uh, the council chambers here are the thick-walled rooms with numbers inside of them. And the dot dash lines are post-reinforced uh, adobe rooms. And most of those are probably residential rooms, but there are a few, two large uh, post-reinforced rooms as well. So either you have uh, six council chambers here, or maybe you have eight council chambers. 
you know, sort of four and four, one, uh, four for uh, each of the two platforms. Now, platform mounts can include private residences, but not always. Next slide, please. Here's a platform mount constructed in the Tonto Basin around AD 1280. It has only it has no residential rooms, just council chambers, um, and the mound. And for instance, the vessels at the site were heavily dominated by serving bowls. So there wasn't any food storage going on, but serving bowls were used for uh, uh, apparently feast occasions. So it's only later in the sequence that some people began to build their homes at the platform mounds. And keep this in mind because I'm going to come back to it. Now I just want to point out that it wasn't until about 30 years ago with the Roosevelt Platform Mound Study, which I directed with some of my colleagues sitting here in this room, and the Roosevelt Community Development Study, directed by Bill and his colleagues, that archaeologists had a sufficiently large sample of ex excavated platform mounds to see the relationship uh, between the mounds and council chambers. Once we saw that, we could look back at earlier excavations of mounds and see that there, this was a consistent pattern. So, um, so I haven't established that. I will now take a look at the cactus wine ceremony. And this was a ritual held by the Tono and Akimil Aden in the 19th and 20th centuries, and it could well be held today, I don't know. And I'll describe it first using a, a set of paintings by the noted Tono Aden artist, Mike Giago, and then examine the archaeological evidence for its practice in antiquity. The ritual, uh, it required the cooperation of four villages. A host village prepared and served the wine and invited the members of three other villages to join in the observance. The wine was made from the fruits of the sorrel cactus. And the fruit ripened uh, slowly over a period of three weeks. And so the households camped out in their favorite stands of cactus and harvested the fruits on a daily basis. The fruits were knocked off the cactus using long poles made of the ribs of the cactus. And each day, the pulp from the harvested fruits was cooked and separated into seeds, jar, jam, and syrup. The syrup would eventually be used for wine and was accumulated in a sealed jar. And the seeds and jams would become food for the household. And the seeds, by the way, are highly nutritious. When the harvest was over, each household took a portion of the syrup to the council chamber, and um, they added it to eight to 10 jars that were in the chamber, uh, filling them with syrup to be fermented into the wine. And then this leads into the archaeological evidence. In order to maintain a constant temperature for the fermentation, the jars were set into holes dug into the ground that were lined with grass, and sometimes a small fire was used to keep the temperature even. So for the next two nights, the men, next slide please, the men and women of the village, perhaps up to 100 people, danced in front of the council chamber to assist the fermentation of the wine. The dancing was accompanied by songs describing the coming of clouds and rain. And several shamans would occasionally step out into the middle of the circle uh, with eagle plumes and perhaps crystals, trying to divine when the rains would arrive. So on the third day, when hopefully the wine had fermented, the members of all four villages gathered for the eat, sit, and drink ritual. And that's this illustration. Um, early in that, that morning, the host village sent messengers to invite the people from the guest villages. And the, the invitation to, to come and the response, the acceptance of the uh, invitation were all memorized speeches. Uh, these were part of a liturgy. They were very formalized. Um, then when the guests arrived at the host village at around noontime, um, they were invited to sit again using formal orations from the liturgy. Um, Ruth Underhill even suggests that um, they were standing around outside of the circle, and when each uh, village priest was invited to sit down, um, the males from his tribal, from his council, um, lifted him up and carried him to his seating place. So there's, again, a lot of respect being shown. The priests from the, each of the villages sat at the four cardinal directions, and then the men from their village 
sat down next to them and eventually forming a circle of people uh, around the uh, open space. And sometimes they were even seen sitting two rows deep. Uh, so that's not shown here in Ron Jago's drawing, which is probably uh, represents a situation that he saw or a photograph that he saw sometime in the early 20th century. Um, so it's changed a little bit from the description that I'm getting out of Underhill. Um, once seated, there were additional set speeches. And they were delivered in a call and a response exchange between pairs of priests. And once one pair of priests had exchanged their, their speeches, there was a round of the wine was served. And uh, the wine was taken first to the priests and then to the other men sitting in the circles. Uh, Ron Schalko actually shows women sitting uh, with the man here, and that could be a later uh, change in the practice. Now, the speeches uh, delivered during the sit and drink um, address the rain gods of the four directions. So the next slide, please. The rain gods were different colored mockingbirds living in special houses called waki in the spirit world. And for the period of the ritual, the four priests were proxies for the rain gods. And their council chambers, the council chambers of the priests, were also called waki. So the liturgy, the liturgy describes the spiritual waki as filled with clouds, seeds, and moisture, and streams of water issue from beneath the waki. Next slide, please. As the priests drunk the wine, the mockingbird deities in their waki also grew drunk. And as their bodies became infused with the wine, um, so did the world become infused with moisture. And the, uh, at the beckoning of the uh, mockingbirds, of the deities, uh, they summoned the wind, the white clouds, and the black clouds, the forked lightning, the thunder, and these brought the rain, and it spread across the earth from east to west, north to south, and ro the clouds rose to the top of the, of the sky. Next slide, please. The liturgy then describes the sprouting of the plants in the fields. They sent down thick roots, sent up thick stalks, had broad leaves, and the crops ripened. And this liturgy is repeated uh, almost identically for uh, the east and the north and the south. And it changes only a little bit for the west because the west is from, it's where the winter rains come from and they are the uh, rains that, that bring life to the desert. So the next, and the winter rains are described as a soft gray drizzle, uh, but sufficient to wet the whole earth. The, Desert blooms then with salad greens, seeds to be parched, mesquite beans, and cactus foods. Next. So now I'm going to look at the archaeological evidence um, for the uh, practice of the cactus wine ceremony uh, in antiquity. And there's, the evidence goes back to 800 AD. Next slide, please. The most prevalent, there's the three sets of evidence that I'll discussed, the most prevalent are the rows of pits, slightly burned, sometimes with a little bit of ash in the bottom, that were presumably used to hold large jars during the fermenting of the wine. And this is a set that were found at Snake Town, and they date to about 800 AD. And um, th these continue to be f found, and uh, uh, here, so f 400 centuries later, 500 centuries later, uh, clusters of these pits are also found at the Pueblo Grande platform mound here in the city of Phoenix and in two places of Pueblo Grande, um, within the compound for the platform mound and also outside of the compound uh, next to a residential compound. They're found at uh, Las Colinas next to the platform mound. They're found at Grand Canal Ruin outside of a residential compound. So they occur in different areas, not necessarily only with the platform mound. And because there are always multiple pits like this arranged in rather formal clusters, 
Um, we, can, we know that the wine was prepared in batches. It was intended for consumption by a large gathering. So the second set of evidence, next slide, are etched designs in levocardium shells. And it's possible that the swirl wine was the acid used to dissolve the shell away from the resist to form the raised uh, designs on these shells. The shells might have been the ceremonial drinking cup in which the wine was served. And these containers shown here are also from Snake Town and they date to about 1000 AD to 1150 AD. And third, the next slide please, were large jars with etched interiors, having held an acidic beverage, located inside a council chamber at the Klein Terrace platform mound in Tana Basin during the uh, 1300s. So if we take a look at the next slide, the large jars were, uh, the, the four council chambers are arranged around this plaza, and the large jars are found in room 78. Um, so it's, it's possible that uh, the, the wine, the sit and drink ceremony was held in this plaza. And think of what that would mean. The host pre priest was no longer the only priest sitting in front of a council chamber. Each of the presiding priests was backed up in an actual council chamber in this plaza. And with this arrangement, a platform mound becomes a stage for the enactment of collective religious, religious rights. And it's probably re replicating a cosmological model um, with a platform mound, with a East Council Chamber at the platform mound reflecting a vaki, a spiritual vaki, uh, at the four corners of the earth. And this kind of pattern where you have multiple platform, multiple council chambers together began during the ball court era. So they're also found at the ball courts. Uh, but the stage became more formal with the transition to the platform mounds. Um, now, why are the Horokan putting four council chambers together? Why are they holding ceremonies that requires the participation of four villages? I think it's because they had a sense of inclusiveness. If one congregation singing for rain was good, four congregations were better. Eight might have even been better. And Next, I want to talk about the antiquity of the liturgy. And this liturgy, by the way, is very formalized and it is completely committed to memory. There is no written liturgy. It was passed down from one priest to the, as the next priest, and it was all done by memory. And yet, there's considerable consistency between uh, different river systems, different uh, valleys and even through time as it was recorded by anthropologists. So the text of the current autumn litur liturgy, I think, has clues that it originated, originated in the platform mound era. In the context of the wine ritual, council chambers are called waki. And this term is applied to council chambers in the world of living and to the houses of the four rain deities in the spirit world. It happens that waki is also the term used in Holocom oral histories for, his, for sites with platform mounds. So in the oral histories, Casa Grande, Casa Blanca, Blanca, Pueblo Grande, and Mesa Grande are all called waki. So the usage of waki in both the liturgical and historical texts is an heirloom of a time when the association between waki and platform mounds was still well known, between council chambers and platform mounds was still well known. This is not an association that can be made today without archeological excavation. Today, the platform mounds appear as low hills of dirt, and an observer cannot know that the council chambers are buried in the mound. If the liturgy for the wine ceremony developed in the centuries following the abandonment of the platform mounds, it and the historical narratives would not have been using the terms in slightly different, but nonetheless related ways. So the modern liturgy is based, I think, on a liturgy employed in antiquity at the platform mounds. Undoubtedly it has changed, but aspects of it remain the same. So what does this tell us about Hohokam religion? First, Hohokam religion didn't, was not replaced by slaughter religion, and Jeff acknowledges that, because elements of it are still practiced by the modern autumn. And the cactus wine ritual 
um, was performed during the Balkar era, well before the appearance of Slaughter ideology. It was performed at the platform mounds. It continues to be performed in the present, and it involves floral fruit, which occurs only in the desert. This was a Hohokam ritual, not a plateau ritual. Second, Hohokam religion, including that practice at platform mounds, was inclusive. It involved the active participation of the populace in multiple villages, and the populace took part in the ritual itself. The laity were needed to collect the fruit for making the wine, that is, there were households involved. The wine was prepared in large batches to be consumed by a large assembly of people at a public gathering. There was feasting. And the ritual was a supplication to the deities for rain, a concern that involves the entire community. Um, so now, why were the platform mounds abandoned? It was not because Salado ideology replaced Hohokam beliefs. The contrast between Salado populism and a hierarchical and restrictive Hohokam religion is a false one. It doesn't hold up to the evidence. Platform mound religion was certainly as inclusive and participatory as Salado ideology. Elements of Salado ideology were adopted by the Hohokam on the platform mounds because the, uh, because the two ideologies were compatible, not contrastive. So why were the platform mounds abandoned? And um, following the, uh, one reason may well be that uh, there was a Hohokam insurgency as related to the autumn historical narratives. The, the insurgency was directed against the people living on the platform mounds and some versions of that, of that uh, narrative stress that it's the people on the platform mounds. And uh, the insurgents were upset because the people at the platform mounds had, had offended a central Hohokam deity. So the people living on the mounds were the families of the priests and shamans. And how could they have offended the deity? Well, this was probably an offense both uh, on the spiritual level and on the social level. It's easy to understand. Um, uh, that people were offended socially because there was an usurpation of public ritual space for private residences. Um, so an, an, an insurgency is a good explanation for the abandonment of the platform mounds, but it is also a proximate explanation. explanation. It is not an ultimate explanation. I don't think that's the underlying factor behind the abandonment of the platform mounds. One factor that I'll suggest is that the platform mounds and much of the rest of the Southwest was, were depopulated, was depopulated because the size of the agricultural population had exceeded the threshold that could be supported with the known technologies. And the resulting increase in substance stress, stress triggered declines in population. In a very recent article, Jeff and his co-authors suggested another factor the population growth may have triggered epidemic diseases leading to demographic de decline. And this is uh, called the Neolithic demographic transition and is observed uh, globally. So here are two different uh, hy hypotheses that relate to the ultimate factors for the uh, abandonment of the platform mounds. Now, um, my rebuttal to Jeff and his colleagues is, of course, only part of the scientific process. It does not detract from the significance of their considerable achievements. And um, because of the research, the researchers have made a substantial and lasting contribution to the Southwest archaeology. Because of their research, we have a much better understanding of Cayenta migration we know, and of how the Salado ideology was related to that migration uh, and how it developed out of the uh, interaction of the migrants and the local populations. So, uh, and Ar Archaeology Southwest has shown the importance of examining large data sets on a multi-regional scale. And so I greatly appreciate, Bill, this chance to have been a fly in your ointment. <laughs> So, uh, not a lot of fighting, <laughs> but uh, we do have still some time for uh, some questions, so I'll, there you go. 
Okay, the question is, is there a gender balance in the, in the migrant population or is it uh, male or female or what do you think? That's a good question. Um, certainly um, from the evidence we have in the Kayanta region about who makes pottery, including things like Salado Polychrome down here or, or Maverick Mountain, it's the women. Um, um, and there's female burials up in Kayanta that uh, have uh, um, um, full pottery uh, tool making kits and there are, as far as I know, no men. Um, but um, these enclave settlements, I, I, I didn't get to go into them. I showed you one re ruin. They look like um, whole families, whole households are present. Um, you know, they're maybe a clan sized group, or maybe something a little bit bigger. So I would argue um, that um, uh, we didn't get into an obsidian trade, but there's an obsidian network that's going around uh, some of these Salado enclaves that's coming from New Mexico, Mule Creek. And that I think, uh, and they're making projectile points as well, and I think that's a more male network. So I think whole families are present in many cases, and we're not just dealing with, uh, uh, there's one model that's women refugees because we see the Salado polychromes as very, um, you know, that's very distinctive and they're being produced by women. But I think the, the men were also there um, in these settlements. Okay, yes. So that you see architecture with walls that, that create around compounds, et cetera. So what is the, can you share your microphone? Yeah. The organization of the compounds uh, uh, is similar to uh, the organization of households before there are walls. And so the walls appear, um, but otherwise the organization of the rooms don't change dramatically. Um, and the walls could well be um, an expression of what's called costly signaling. Now they might be there for increased privacy at the household level, but it might be a way for the households uh, to express um, uh, the size of the, of the households. And these were extended households that were quite large, and uh, and they probably grew larger through time. We know that they grew larger through time, and, and the, um, the so the walls are one way of signaling the uh, uh, political clout of that particular household. Uh, and the greater the walls, uh, the, the, the greater the clout. And each household, multi-household group, also had a pile, a mound, an earthen mound, sometimes several earthen mounds, uh, located outside of, of the compound. And again, it's hard to explain why are you building your trash up into, into piles, and sometimes they're even just piling up dirt. But again, this is, I think, an expression of what is called costly signaling. Um, so it's a way of uh, maintaining balance with the, against the other households, with the other households, so that you, you know who's, who, who's bigger than you and who's smaller than you. And you don't have to waste resources trying other forms of competition. It's a way of deflecting competitions. So that's one explanation for walls. And certainly another explanation, explanation is that you know there's a need for greater privacy. I don't think that I, that's the only explanation for the presence of the walls. Um, I, I, so in other words, I think that a lot of the wall building is uh, uh, deflecting labor to to away from uh, exercises that would, like, such as conflict that would uh, 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 detract from the, from the integrity or from the unity of the community. So, so you have, so there's household level which uh, uh, the competition is going on. And then the map cells are a form of competitive emulation, uh, competitive uh, costly signaling um, as well. So um, between communities. So there's a contrast in size of bowls over time and the decoration fields, but uh, so that argument isn't contested. Um, but what is happening with jars for these uh, decorated types directed at Jeff? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, you have um, jars do come in later. Um, 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 than the, the bowls, so uh, the Tonto polychrome and Gila polychrome jars are later. Um, I, I'm not sure how much of a detailed analysis has, has been done in terms of the, the placement of jars, but I, if, 
I would potentially relate them to the feasting tradition in, in terms of storing um, uh, foods uh, to be used in feasts and and at the same time you know by the by definition being a jar the the, the, the uh, designs are on the outside like the bowls as well so you have uh, signaling going on with that as well and um, I don't know the jar data size data offhand but some of the jars are, are pretty good size so they could have been used for uh, for, for feasting. But yeah, jars are coming in later in time. And just about, uh, the big bowls are coming in a little bit later than the jars, but they're, they're all there as a package um, 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 after uh, 1360 or so. so. So if the early polychromes were made by migrants, um, how did, is it, can you explain later polychromes just by uh, spread of a new technology uh, across the population rather than um, having to be made by migrants? That's a very, uh, very good question. And, and that's something that I think is a, a point of uh, uh, active debate amongst uh, um, Hohokam archaeologists down here. Um, certainly, um, design motifs can be emulated very easily because you can see the, 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 the um, they're very visual. Symmetry on jars and bowls are a little more difficult, but you can still emulate that as well. And that's where we get down to this argument about coil and scrape versus paddle and anvil, because that doesn't encode any information or signaling. That's telling you how you were raised in, in, in so many ways. If you were raised to make a, a pot using the paddle and anvil technique, that's probably the way you would make a salado polychrome bowl. And then you know you would decorate it to look like a salado polychrome bowl. If you were raised with the coil and scrape method, you would start out with that forming technique. And that's one thing that really differentiates, especially when you when you get the Phoenix Basin, whole compotters, paddle and anvil, um, and, uh, and Pueblo potters, coil and scrape. So if we can get into that issue about how a pot is formed, that might actually tell us whether it's a kind of descendants making the, the, most of these pots, or, um, or, or a lot of local groups, you know, who've bought onto the, got, jumped onto the Slotto bandwagon, are, are they making these pots? Uh, does that make sense? So we've pushed our time here and really need to, to wrap up. I want to thank our two uh, speakers tonight. Uh, both Jeff and, and uh, Glenn have done a great job. And I really, it was a, a incredible experience working with Glenn. And I think there's an amazing um, you know, information uh, that accumulation that's happened over the course of our careers. There's still, I think, a lot of this kind of getting together, sharing information, and uh, really trying to keep pushing on these uh, complex, we're thinking about and talking about much more complicated things than when we started back 30 some years ago. So thank you all for uh, joining the, the conversation here. Linda has the little tags that encourage you to do your uh, online survey, and we will be back in the fall, and we'll be back with funding if you all turn in your <laughs> uh, evaluation. So thank you all uh, for coming out tonight, and thank our speakers.